The following is an audio to the English language from a volunteer. The one who speaks is your servant, Dr. Javier Palacio Celorio, Minister of the Kehila, the Congregation, Joy and Peace, Hanabe Shalom, Gozo y Paz. Headquartered in the city of Tehuacan in Puebla, Mexico, we invite you, your family, and friends to visit us online at www.joyandpeace.us. There, you'll find study materials that you can download and copy for free. This is the second part of the study titled, The Misinterpretation of the Torah. I'm going to continue where I left off on part one. If you haven't listened to the first part of the study, our advice is that you listen to part one to understand part two. Go ahead and turn your Tanakh to the book of Galatians on chapter four. We're going to read verses eight through 11. The book of Galatians chapter four, verses eight through 11. Here, the Tanakh reads, But then indeed, when you did not know Elohim, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known Elohim, or rather are known by Elohim, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. So how do the traditions of man interpret these verses? The Galatians were returning to the Law of Moses, which is the Torah, and were not holding fast to the Gospel. But what is a true understanding of these verses? The divine message from the Ruach HaKodesh. In order to understand these verses, we have to understand that the Galatians never possessed or lived by the Holy Torah. So, how could they be going back to the Torah, the Law of Moses, when they never had it? The Galatians were Gentiles. They worshipped idols, mythology, astrology, etc. They worshipped false gods and were returning to idol worship. Rav Shaul, Paul, was warning them about this. Let's go to the next set of verses that have also been badly misunderstood. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew, chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Matthew, Matthew, chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Here, the Tanakh says, one who puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. How does Christian tradition interpret and understand these verses? They say, The grace that Jesus Christ brought to us cannot be contended by the law of Moses, the Torah. But what is the true understanding of these verses according to the voice of the Ruach HaKodesh that was heard by the prophets? The true understanding is that Yahshua HaMashiach himself gave us the correct interpretation to the Torah by his example. And that the religions, the doctrines of the Gentiles, did not fit into this mold. But that Yahshua HaMashiach himself showed us the correct interpretation of the Torah by his examples and his lifestyle. Remember, grace has always existed. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 8, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of Adonai, in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, Yahshua HaMashiach was referring to the Torah not of grace because grace has always existed in the book of psalm on chapter 119 king david talks about grace and experiments with grace now let's go to another verse that has been misunderstood by christian tradition go ahead and turn to the book of philippians chapter 3 verse 8 philippians chapter 3 verse 8 here the tanakh says yet indeed i also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Mashiach, Messiah, Yahshua, my Lord, my Adonai, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Mashiach, or Messiah. How does Christian tradition explain and understand this verse? They say, you see, Rav Shaul, Paul, rejected the law of Moses, the Torah, and counted it as rubbish. But what is a true understanding? The divine message that was delivered to the prophets on behalf of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. What Rav Shaul Paul was referring to 
was that everything that he had gained through his flesh was rubbish. You see, Rav Shaul Paul was a very smart man. He knew many languages. He had traveled to many places, to many lands, and had experienced many things. But now that he was saved, he counted all those things as rubbish, that he may gain Messiah, Mashiach. Rav Shaul Paul never rejected the Holy Torah. In fact, if you turn to the book of Acts, on chapter 24, verse 14, Paul says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all things which were written in the law, the Torah, and the prophets. On chapter 25, verse 8, Paul says, Neither against the Torah of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. On chapter 26, verse 22 of Acts, Paul says, Therefore, having obtained help from Elohim, to this day I stand, witnessing to those small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses, Moshe, said would come. And again on chapter 28, verse 17 of Acts, Rav Shaul Paul says, I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers. As you can see, Paul, Rav Shaul, never said anything negative about the Torah and the prophets, much less think of it as trash or rubbish. In fact, he kept the Holy Torah, and so did our Lord, Yahshua HaMashiach, and all the prophets before him, and all his disciples kept the Torah. Even today, nothing has changed. All his true followers and disciples keep the Holy Torah. Now, let's go to another set of verses that have also been badly misunderstood by traditions. In the book of Revelations on chapter 2 verse 9 and on chapter 3 verse 9. We'll read chapter 2 verse 9 first of Revelations. It reads, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. On Revelations chapter 3 verse 9 it says, Indeed I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie, indeed I will make them worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. How does Christian tradition interpret these verses? They say, these verses refer to, they say, the Gentiles who now keep the law of Moses, the Torah. They have rejected the gospel, the truth, they say, and are now in darkness. But what is the true understanding of these verses? The divine message according to the voice of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. These verses refer to those who claim to have replaced Israel. Elohim has never destroyed his people. If you turn to Romans chapter 11 verse 1, on Romans chapter 11 verse 1, it reads, I say then, has Yahweh cast away his people? Certainly not, Rav Shaul says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Those verses refer to those people who look like Jews, talk like Jews, act like Jews, but are not Jews. Why? Because according to verse 10, they have not kept the commandments to persevere. Therefore, these verses refer to anyone claiming to be a Jew from anywhere in the world, but that are not keeping the commandments. In other words, they're still stealing, they're still lying. They're still worshiping other gods, other idols, committed adultery. Um, they don't keep the Shabbat. They don't keep the feast, etc. And only Yahshua HaMashiach knows who they are. Because remember, anyone from anywhere in the world right now can repent, follow Yahshua HaMashiach, remain in holiness, and become a real Hebrew, a, a real Yehudin, a real follower, a real Jew, and be saved. The scriptures say that anyone who wants to be saved must come to the only one who saves, the Almighty Yahweh the Elohim of the Israelites, through the power and grace of Yahshua HaMashiach, following his Torah. In the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verse 16, the Bible says, One Torah and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells within you. It was never that, well, the Jews have a Torah, one truth, and the Christians, well, they have another truth, and, and well, the Mormons, they, they have another truth, and they're going to be saved, and, and the Jehovah's Witnesses have another one. And the Catholics, they have another one too. No, one Torah and one custom shall be for you and for the stranger, says Numbers 15, verse 16. 
Here's another verse that has been misunderstood by tradition. Let's go to the book of John, Yohanan, John, on chapter 7, verse 2. Remember, all of this material will be recorded, so you can always go back and check these verses for yourself. There are also texts online that you can use to verify in your Bible, in your Tanakh. John chapter 7 verse 2 says, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. How does Christian tradition understand and interpret this verse? They say, You see, the feast in the book of Leviticus belonged to the Jews only and not to us, the Christians. But what is the real explanation, the divine message according to the Ruach HaKodesh that was heard by the prophets? The Gospel of John of Yohanan was mainly directed towards an audience of Gentiles. The Gentiles amongst themselves referred to these feasts as the Feast of the Jews. Therefore, to better identify these feasts, they sometimes referred them as the Feast of the Jews, since they were Gentiles, of course. But these feasts, as we have learned, do not exclusively belong to the Jews. In fact, they only belong to the Almighty Yahweh. Let's go to the book of Leviticus on chapter 23, verse 2. Here, Yahweh says to Moshe, to Moses, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of, of Adonai, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts, my feasts. This is why it is very important that we observe his feasts and not the feasts of the world, you see. He doesn't say, well, when you have time, come, come to my feasts if you're not working, you know. If you have time, it is not an invitation. It is a commandment. Therefore, we must participate in the holy feasts, including the weekly Shabbat, which is also a holy feast. The consequences of not doing so will be severe. Let's go to the next verse that has also been badly misunderstood by the traditions of man. Go ahead and turn your Bible to the book of Matthew, 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 chapter 11, verse 13. Here it reads, For all the prophets and the law, or the Torah, prophesied until John, until Yohanan. How does Christian tradition interpret and understand this verse? They say, you see, the requirements of the law, the Torah, came to an end with John the Baptist. But what is the true understanding of this verse? The divine message that the prophets heard from the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Torah could not have ended with John, with Yohanan, with John the Baptist. This verse is referring to the triumph of the reach of the Torah in John's life and not to its validity because the validity of the Torah is eternal. The books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, and Zechariah all speak clearly of a post-death and resurrection period in the future, most notably the millennium reign of Yahshua HaMashiach, where the Holy Torah will still be valid. For example, in the book of Isaiah, on chapter 11, verse 2, it reads, The Spirit of the Lord, Adonai, shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and a fear of Yahweh. Here it is talking about the Holy Torah. On verses 6 through 9, it talks about the millennium, where it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the goat, the calf and young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the winged child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Adonai. Here's another set of verses that have also been misunderstood by the traditions of man. In the book of Acts on chapter 10, verses 9 through 15, Kephas, Peter, Kephas, fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Adonai, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. A voice spoke to him a second time, What Adonai has cleansed, you must not call common. 
How does Christian tradition understand and interpret these verses? They say, you see, we can eat anything we want now. But what is the true understanding of these verses according to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit? In these verses, Elohim never said that he changed what he had already established in the book of Leviticus chapter 11. Kephas Peter, Kephas, was commissioned to speak to the Gentiles now that Yahweh had prepared them to receive his word. But why the vision? The answer is in the book of Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 27 where it says, Behold, the days are coming, says Adonai, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beasts. Peter's vision had nothing to do with food but with people. In essence, the house of Israel and the house of Judah have sinned so much against the Torah until now that they have become as wild beasts, wild animals, unclean, guided only by their instincts. Peter, Kephas, had never eaten anything unclean in the eyes of Yahweh. In fact, he never ate anything unclean after his vision. Peter was simply ministering the Torah to Cornelio, who was a Gentile. Here's another set of verses that have been badly misunderstood by traditions. In the book of Mark, on chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, Mark chapter 7, verses 18 through 23, the Tanakh says, Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, how does Christian tradition interpret and understand these verses? They say, you see, Jesus said we can eat anything we want. But what is the true understanding of these verses? According to the Ruach HaKodesh, Yahshua HaMashiach never said we could eat anything we wanted. He was speaking in parables about curses that come out of the mouth of a person and the negative effects evil thoughts has on people. On Proverbs 12 verse 18 it reads, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. Here's another verse that has been misunderstood by Christian tradition. In the book of Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 5, the Tanakh says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which Yahweh created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of Elohim is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of Elohim and prayer. How does Christian tradition understand and interpret these verses? They say, Many people are going to leave the holy doctrine, they say, and stop eating certain foods that have been sanctified with prayer. They will stop marrying and lie, giving to the heat of doctrines of demons. Therefore, go ahead and eat whatever you want. But what is the true understanding, the divine message, according to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit? Rashaul Paul is not saying to Timothy that everything can be eaten. He's saying that in the last days, people would listen more to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies as hypocrisies, forbidding to marry. Now, we don't forbid anyone to marry, but there is a group of Christians that does forbid to marry. I'm not going to mention them here. Commanding to abstain from eating only kosher, which Yahweh commanded according to Leviticus 11. To be received with thanksgiving. Those are the foods that, that he gave us to receive with thanksgiving. The foods that are permitted in Leviticus chapter 11. By those who believe and know the truth. The Torah. You see how these verses come alive with true understanding? If we look at them from a Hebrew's point of view, 
in not a Greek or a Roman's point of view, we can easily see what Rav Shaul, what Paul was trying to say, what Kephas, what Peter was trying to say, what Yahshua HaMashiach was trying to say. Rav Shaul, Paul would have never said that now we could eat any animal we wanted. That would have been a transgression to the Holy Torah. He would have never done it. Rav Shaul, Paul was telling a prophecy about the future where these doctrines of demons would tell lies, being hypocrites, condemning marriage, and commanding that it was all right to eat any animal because the Torah, which they call the law, would be destroyed and now they could just eat anything they want and there wouldn't be any trouble. This cannot be denied. Today, we are seeing evidence of this on a monumental scale. Rasha Paul, Yahshua Mashiach, and the other disciples knew about all this 2,000 years ago. On verse 5 where it says the word, it is talking about Leviticus 11. Therefore, our food is sanctified by the word first, by Leviticus chapter 11, from which animals that we, we can eat, and then by prayer. Let's go to another set of verses that have been misunderstood by tradition. Turn your Tanakh to the book of Romans, on chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Here it reads, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for Yahweh has received him. How does Christian tradition understand and interpret these verses? They say, you see, he who bases their diet on the law of Moses is weak in the faith. But what is the true understanding of these verses? The divine message according to the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The weak is not he who eats only kosher, or for those who don't know what kosher is, foods permitted by Yahweh that are written in the book of Leviticus chapter 11. The weak is he who does not have a true understanding of the Holy Scriptures as a whole, who does not understand the Holy Torah. This is the weak in the faith. The weak in this case cannot be those who eat kosher because then we would be saying that all the prophets, all the, that all the prophets, that Yahshua HaMashiach, all the true followers, the 12 disciples are weak in the faith. But we know they're not weak in the faith. They're not weak in the faith. They are extremely strong in the faith. And anyone who would say otherwise would be an error, would be believing a man-made lie or something not found in the Bible, the Tanakh. This concludes the second part of the study titled, The Misinterpretation of the Torah. I will leave you with a verse from Yahshua HaMashiach. In the book of Matthew in Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, it reads, Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Remember, all the study material is completely free of charge online at www.joyandpeace.us. We hope and pray that this study will be a blessing for you and your family. May Yahshua HaMashiach keep you and bless you in the holy name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Omen be Omen.